so so thank you all. I'm extremely excited to be here and share more about what we've been doing with the blockchain automation framework and Hyperledger Labs. Um, I, I think uh, it, we'll, we'll be sharing a bit of the journey. How did we get here? Um, and, and some other pieces uh, about uh, what, how we view the, the landscape of, of the various different DLT fr uh, frameworks. Uh, but before that we do that, let's do a quick intro. Um, so my name is Michael Klein. I lead our uh, blockchain and multi-party systems architecture group globally within Accenture. Um, I'm responsible for, for the blockchain automation framework as well as Hyperledger Cactus and our contributions there and the number of other technology assets that we have at Accenture. Um, Suvajit, would you like to give a, a quick update? Yeah, sure. Quick uh, yeah, uh, hi everyone, I'm Shivajit Sarkar and uh, I've been in Accenture for a year and I've been working uh, at the BAP maintainer since it's open source. So uh, my work at BAP is like kind of uh, being the maintainer and as well as the tech lead. Thanks. Great. Yeah. Well, like I said, uh, we're excited to be here, but before I start talking about blockchain and DLT, I did want to share a little bit of our point of view from Accenture and how we look at the, the changing space of data within organizations. And, and first off, when we look at the, 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 our clients and our customers of how they are um, taking, uh, making different changes and making different choices, in this uh, era of a pandemic and the need to be more virtual, we're seeing a lot more drive towards digital, virtual and cloud-based services. And we think there's a real opportunity for our clients and our customers to be thinking about not just their, their journey to the cloud, how do they become more virtual, but also how can they take advantage of new ways of sharing data and, and actually maximizing their investments in these shifts towards cloud uh, platforms in a way that allows them to better collaborate and tear down the corporate firewalls between organizations. How can they collaborate better with their partners and, and change the way in which they're sharing data? And, and what, what we really mean by this is what, and this is sort of the, the foundation of this idea of multi-party systems versus just blockchain. Looking at, there's many different ways in which we can share data, many different patterns, and I think all are valid as we really try to, to break down these data silos that have evolved over the past you know, many decades. And so when we look at this idea of multi-party systems, it doesn't start with technology. It really starts with this hyper-focus on how we, can we create shared value within an ecosystem. And, and being very, very targeted towards that shared value, how do we actually bring multiple organizations together to agree on a shared strategy and governance, a shared operating model and, and platform, but also how does this ecosystem grow? How does it uh, sustain itself and grow over time and have a way in which it can operate where that shared value can be unlocked for all participants? I think we, we often talk about this um, as the, the side, yes, we need to solve that in the technology space, but what we see when we go implement this with uh, a number of uh, very large organizations that this is the hardest part of multi-party systems is actually getting the right governance operating model and, and growth model for that to be a sustainable model to actually support the need for the technology. And so um, that ecosystem comes first, but then it's not just that blockchain is the answer. And I think what we want to really do is, is really focus on not, not just one blockchain platform, but also other types of ways and other types of technology patterns that can be used to share data between organizations in new and different ways. And so this is sort of the evolution of data sharing um, in a very, very simplified slide. But you know, back in the early days, we would send the data. We'd sort of replicate those, uh, the physical mail item uh, you know, sending a letter in the mail and now we have email, right? So that, that move from the physical to the digital world and sort of replicating that. And we say we're sending that data from one organization to the next. Um, then we've, we've, you know, become more advanced, applied new techniques and started sh keeping a shared record between data, uh, between organizations. And this is possible with things like da distributed databases, but the ability to actually share data in a common consistent state is, is also another option. 
And then what, what is fundamentally new and what came in the, in the advent of blockchain is this idea of sharing assets, having uniquely digital objects that can be shared between multiple uh, custodians and, and asset holders. And you can prove with, through the technology that uh, that, that um, digital object is unique. And, I, and that's, that's something, a unique feature of a distributed ledger, especially as it relates to distributed systems. And so when we look at multi-party systems, what we're saying is all of these patterns are valid. valid. And what we want to do is look at what are the needs of the ecosystem and how do we apply the correct technology pattern to a given ecosystem's problems. Um, so we said that we talk about automating block, uh, blockchain deployments and, and we are. So that was sort of my intro of uh, multi-party systems and how we sort of look at the overall space um, and really how we, we got to the, the space of uh, blockchain automation framework. But uh, about four years ago, we started working on uh, a reference architecture. Uh, the first version is four or five years ago. Um, uh, the DLT reference architecture. And, and we've evolved it a couple times since then, added and removed uh, items to it. Um, and what it was is essentially, we looked at the ways in which uh, a DLT or blockchain platform would be implemented and said, we should have a standard way that this integrates with the rest of the technology stack. When we look at a full production implementation, what are all the capabilities that would be necessary in order to deliver a full solution for uh, a customer. So we, we, we developed this and, and it was quite, quite a com complete as far as we could, were concerned. We had a lot of success for it, but our developers and our technical people wanted more. Um, they said, well, these are, this is a lot of nice slides, but how do I actually go implement this? How do I have consistency? How can we accelerate the deployment and make this easier for everyone. And so um, some of those, we said, well, we, we want to turn that reference architecture into something physical. So we started looking at the landscape and saying, well, what are the common challenges across all of our different uh, customers and all of our different projects? What are those things that we really want to try to solve? And so when we, when we sort of scoured the landscape, we talked to a lot of people and we had a, a, a few common concerns, right? And, and number one of those was no reuse of assets. So we're building something new for every single implementation and it feels unnecessary. Why do we keep on rebuilding from scratch? It's expensive and hard. And I think um, for people who've been in the blockchain space for a while, you understand that you know, developing your applications themselves is not actually the hard part in the technology space. It's actually administering all the different nodes and getting everything to stand up and talk to one another, especially if you're dealing with firewalls and other sort of complex things that you need to poke holes in in the networking space and getting all of your TLS certificates and everything to connect, right? It's hard and complicated. The applications tend, up to, tend to be quite a bit easier um, in scale. So it's hard to get these things rolled out. Uh, the, there's technology silos and vendor lock-in. So we see a lot of solutions out in the marketplace where the focus is trying to capture a certain market, right? And so what that does is in the space of where we're trying to build ecosystems, it's creating pockets of innovation and trying to say everything should be done in this specific technology. And, and we wanted to avoid that as much as possible. And then um, that we saw a high risk of selecting the wrong platform uh, that is actually foundational to how we, um, you know, the foundations of how we came up with Hyperledger Cactus as well. Um, and, and then uh, we saw that there weren't established best practices. So that con um, conformance with the DLT reference architecture was not necessarily easy to do, right? Everyone sort of had their own interpretation. And so what we wanted to do is um, we wanted to say, what could we do to solve these challenges? and actually accelerate the adoption of the technology and make it easier and more accessible to everyone. That brings us to the blockchain automation framework. Um, so really what blockchain automation framework started as within Accenture, and this was started about 2018, is this idea of how do we take that 
you know, uh, high level reference architecture and make it physical? How can we give all of our people um, within our organization the ability to have a consistent way to deploy uh, blockchain and DLT uh, platforms? And I'm gonna let Subhajit sort of cover what is blockchain automation? Subhajit, what is it? Yep. Uh, thanks, Mike. So um, if I have to kind of define uh, BAF or the blockchain automation framework in a sentence, I would say a blockchain automation framework is an uh, automation framework which rapidly and uh, consistently and securely uh, deploy, uh, deploys production ready DLT networks. So that, that's the one sentence, uh, in a one sentence if I have to define it. So on a, uh, on a high level or on a nutshell, if you have to look at what uh, BAF does is that, um, as, as you see here in the image, that it kind of takes a single configuration file. So this configuration file kind of consists of uh, various network uh, configurations, such as uh, the DLT platform of choice, your consensus mechanism choice, or, uh, and other organization details and their configuration. So this single configuration file is basically taken as an input by BAF, and uh, the BAF automation kicks into place, and it kind of could deploys those um, DLT, net, uh, DLT of choice into the cloud provider of your choice. So in BAF, what we say is that uh, we, we are kind of a platform agnostic. So uh, it, it's kind of uh, fully dependent on uh, what cloud provider you want to put. So based on your choice, uh, uh, BAF deploys the, the, the DLT network you want to uh, put. So with that, uh, I'll move to some of the principles which uh, BAF uh, kind of adheres to. So the first one, as Mike already kind of talked about the, the DLT reference architecture. So BAF kind of consistently has the uh, methodology and out of box tools and assets to kind of uh, have that architecture and development standard in place. Uh, it also, as uh, I kind of pointed out that it is platform agnostic also, it's kind of infrastructure independent. So there is no uh, lock-in with a particular uh, configuration tool or, or a cloud provider. And uh, in the later slides, we'll also talk about some of the components of, uh, of the automation and, uh, and how these are kind of designed in a modular way. So most of the uh, components or modules in, uh, in BAF using BAF are kind of plug, plug, plug in and play. Uh, so you can choose your modules and components and use that. Also, uh, uh, we, we design BAF uh, in, in a more secure way. So for example, we, we don't save credentials or uh, uh, in, in, in any uh, local place or any configuration file or environment variables. Uh, so we'll more talk about those components in the uh, details in next slides. So uh, also lastly, if I have to touch, yes, in fact, it's open source. Uh, so with the understanding and the concern that we had around the blockchain ecosystem and the necessity to uh, scale a proof of concept to production environment, uh, uh, we kind of uh, have open sourced blockchain or BAF uh, with Hyperledger Labs. So what we have uh, open source is uh, our automation deployment components. Uh, we have also open source our reference uh, architecture and documentations. We have also open source uh, the supply chain ref app and it's all available uh, under the link which is uh, on your uh, slide, yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Suvajit. Um, and I, I just wanna jump in and, and point out um, the a little bit more of our, our open source rationale. So, um, we, we built this this in within Accenture and we, we saw a lot of value, right? We're, we're already capturing a lot of value by reusing this across a number of our, of our customers. But what is really the, one of the biggest rationales for us to make this open source is the fact that IP concerns, especially when building an ecosystem, are very real. And for anyone who's participated in consortium building, we'll, we'll probably you know, second that opinion. Um, how do you actually agree upon who owns these assets? And you know, the goal, like I said at the beginning with blockchain automation framework, wasn't to try to lock in, right? It, our goal wasn't trying to lock in, is actually trying to accelerate these discussions. And, and if we got into a conversation about who owns the IP around this type of automation framework, it doesn't actually accelerate in true implementation. 
what it actually does is hinder because we get into conversations about who owns the IP and whatnot. And that's the exact opposite of what we wanted to do. So by open sourcing blockchain automation framework, we made that IP concern essentially a moot point. We said, look, this is not something that we're even trying to commercialize. We want you to have the same rights to this, this uh, set of code that we do and, and that you can contribute to it as you see fit or you can do, just take it and, and run. And then what we wanna do is make this easier and more accessible for everyone so we can have confidence in, this, in the underlying platform and architecture that we're building upon. I think that that has been, it's actually been such a, a relief, I would say in general, to not have to get into those conversations and just be able to use the right tools and not get locked up in those IP conversations. So um, I'll talk a little bit here and, and Suvaji, please please jump in here about the, yeah. the various components of the, the uh, blockchain automation framework. Um, we mentioned that it, it sort of starts with Kubernetes. So one of the principles is we want to be cloud agnostic. We want this to run on every cloud. Kubernetes is everywhere, um, but that really provides the abstraction layer for us to say, we can run this on-prem, we can run this in any cloud, and fundamentally it doesn't change uh, our platform much. The, the Kubernetes does most of the abstraction for us, so we don't have to be concerned where it runs. Um, next, we wanted to really focus on production. And so when we think about production, what does it mean to operate? In production, we need to change things, we need to keep track of how things change over time. And, and we're a big fan of the GitOps approach, of how do you maintain infrastructure and platforms through code and have that be a declarative type function versus a procedural function to maintain your operations. And, and doing that all from Git at the get-go, uh, pun, uh, is really a, a, great, um, a great way to do that. And so um, looking at what's out there, there's other ways to do this, but we did choose Flux as the Kubernetes operator for effectively making sure whatever we have in Git as our configuration for these environments be guaranteed to match what's deployed in Kubernetes. In fact, uh, we don't even encourage other than looking at logs and sort of checking that things are working that anyone even uses kube control, right? The idea is all configuration for our deployments is done through, uh, through Git and, and Flux automatically applies those changes for us into the environment ensures a consistency in the deployment between what's in Git and what's in, in Kubernetes. Um, we have uh, Helm as the, the, the way in which we do that, right? So Helm is executed via Flux to actually deploy the, the uh, platforms into the, the, the pods and containers running on Kubernetes. Um, and so these are, this is our set of instructions for how we actually deploy. Uh, within the, the Kubernetes environment. And then we use, and sorry, I'm jumping around in no particular order here on the slide, but then we actually use Ansible as a configuration management. management. Now, for people who are familiar with Ansible, you may say, well, Ansible can actually do deployments and it can do a lot of other things. And oftentimes it's used to manage infrastructure and make sure that all the infrastructure has all the right patches applied. That's not actually how we're using it in BAF. BAF is, uh, uses uh, Ansible purely to take a single configuration file and turn it into many Helm value files. That's really what it's doing. It's, it's being used strictly as a configuration management tool to simplify instead of having to create hundreds of configuration files across all the different Helm packages and releases. It may not be 100, I'm exaggerating. But uh, to, to keep that simple for the users, Ansible is effectively being used as a configuration management tool. And quite honestly, and going back to our modular approach, it could be easily replaced with anything else that wants to manage those, those Helm value files. Um, and, and the last thing we have here is HashiCorp Vault. Um, so we're, we're using Vault and, and there's many ways to do this, but with HashiCorp Vault, the idea is we wanted all the secrets to be externalized from the actual deployment. We didn't want anything on a file system anywhere. And if it had to be, it had, we wanted it in Vault. Um, the reason why we liked Vault is number one, it's, it's open source, but also it provides some abstraction from the underlying infrastructure. If we want to replace it with other key management solutions, HashCorp Vault has integrations with many, but also has the ability to, to be fairly easily swapped out as well with other solutions. 
Yep. Okay. Anything, what, Suvajit, what did I miss? Did I miss anything there? Uh, no, Mike, I think you uh, covered it uh, very, uh, very Great. much. So uh, particularly the uh, cloud agnostic part, I would say that, yeah. Uh, so uh, how we kind of achieve the cloud agnostic is through Kubernetes, which I think Mike, you started with. So, yeah. Great. Okay. Um, well, I, I think as we, we jump in here, this is going back to our reference architecture and maps in how does um, BAF actually help implement our reference architecture that we, that we showed sort of at the beginning of our slides. Um, Subhiji, do you want to sort of explain how um, our BAF solves or doesn't solve certain aspects of, of the reference architecture? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, I mean, just kind of uh, to make the audience understand what, what you're seeing right now is I'll just go through the legends which you have. So the blue ones, what you see here on the left-hand side is kind of uh, your uh, deployment and operation architecture. Uh, the green side is basically your runtime or execution architecture. So all uh, of these comp components are kind of, uh, as already discussed, are modular and also kind of uh, without uh, very little or no coupling at all. So these can be inter uh, kind of uh, replaced with some other uh, tools as well. So uh, the uh, imp very important thing, which kind of uh, needs to be looked at is the green circle boxes. So these are kind of the prerequisites which are required uh, for BAF. So it kind of clearly defines what BAF does and what BAF doesn't. So just kind of highlight those is like the, um, like basically the crowd provider and the container services. So those are uh, kind of prerequisite before you deploy uh, BAF. And also the uh, HashiCorp Vault, which is uh, for our credentials and crypto management. So that is also something which is prerequisite and uh, it's not part of your BAF automation. Uh, so just kind of quickly going through some of the uh, other services on the, uh, oper um, on the operation architecture is uh, the Git, uh, which is our version management uh, for configuration management and also uh, very, uh, awesomely kind of described by Mike is that what we use it for is the uh, kind of the various uh, value file or the configuration managements. Uh, the Helm, which is, uh, uh, which is for the Kubernetes package manager. Um, and, and then we have uh, GitHub or the Travis CI and the Jenkins for uh, various build and uh, artifact management. Uh, also in del delivery management, we have read the docs, which is our um, our, our documentation or where we maintain our documentation, documentation. so that is also uh, being open source. Uh, on the uh, our execution architecture or the green side, uh, what you see is that an integration service, we have Ambassador. So uh, Ambassador is basically our ingress service, uh, which is kind of used for, um, let's say we want to do a multi-cluster communication or communication between various components. So uh, in that, uh, Ambassador acts as, as our ingress service. So, um, I mean, with one, uh, I mean, we are using uh, HAProxy as well for, uh, for Fabric, uh, but majorly uh, Ambassador for most of the uh, DLT uh, platforms. Um, currently uh, in uh, DLT platforms, uh, as you see here, we support uh, Corda, we support Hyperledger, Besu, uh, Indy, Fabric, and Quorum as well. Um, so that's from the uh, DLT part. Um, yes, and um, just one more thing is that uh, if you look at your uh, security uh, services on the left-hand side, you'll see that some of them are kind of uh, like, uh, for example, if I look, if I kind of uh, talk about the certificate authority CA here, it is kind of dependent on the client or the customer uh, uh, options. So for, for, if I have to take an example for Fabric, uh, we have uh, the fabric default CA, but in some of our um, uh, customer implementations, we have kind of used, uh, I mean, kind of replaced with their own CA or uh, their own components. So um, that's yeah, my yeah, I'll, I'll just add in one, one more thing here. This is a picture of a single organization, but, you know, this is blockchain automation framework started with what does it take to do production implementation? And then we worked backwards to the automation. And so fundamental to how we designed this is this is actually, this picture is actually replicated 
for every organization, every company that's present that's participating in the in the network. So um, I think the key there uh, that Subhajit uh, covered was the ambassador integration. The fact that we actually have for Fabric already sorted out the TLS integration across uh, uh, multiple organizations. Um, you know, going over the internet and communicating between multiple Kubernetes clusters. Um, we started there and then worked backwards to automating that. Um, and so that's really uh, one of the core principles here is, is we're not trying to make this quick and easy for a developer to run their code on. What we're trying to do is make it quick and easy for an ecosystem to deploy a blockchain network across multiple organizations. And, and those are two different problem spaces and, and why for some people who may have tried out BAF in the past as a developer felt that it was a bit uh, more complicated or more, uh, it didn't work well on Minikube. Well, it, it wasn't designed for that, right? Um, it, it fundamentally was designed to operate in production without fancy UIs and, and making things easier for developers. Um, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, so currently you're supporting Fabric in the Besu, Corda, and Quorum. Uh, are you planning or are you thinking of supporting other platforms as well? And where did the choice come for to, to support those? Yeah, um, great question. Uh, we are currently uh, not focused on adding more platforms. Um, you, you do see the grayed out distributed databases on the slide here. Um, and, and we were looking at that and still continue to keep an eye on it as I talked about our multi-party system strategy, right? Uh, the fact that there's a lot of ways we can solve, uh, but most of it's been on our customer demand. Um, so we're not actually looking to add from our point of view, more platforms at this point in time. Uh, if we did have a need and, and we see a rise in other places, um, definitely would, and we would love others who think there's value in blockchain automation framework to contribute their own platforms into the code base as well. So no, no, uh, no concerns there. Um, right now, what we really wanted to do is focus more on the operational components of the ledgers we already have. I mean, we have five, six sort of, if you count enter quarter enterprise. Um, and there's a lot to do to actually make those more operable. Like what if we want to do in-place upgrades of fabric from version 1.4 to 2.2, right? That is something we want to have some support for. Um, and, and I just threw out that one in random, but we want to start making these that we have a bit more operable and build in some more automation for these specific platforms. Um, so that's where our focus is in the roadmap. And we'll go through that in a little bit, but um, our focus for right now is not adding more, but getting better at the ones we have. Great question, Marta. Thank you. Sorry. Courage, many thinking. more questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your answer. Yeah. Okay. So now, now we get to the real technical stuff. We're gonna, you know, lift the hood back. Let's say, how does this actually work um, when we get into uh, the specific platforms? And then we'll talk a little bit more about what this means. Um, but Supaji, do you want to walk us through, sir, how, how does this work for Fabric? Right, Mike. So, um, I mean, as Mike, uh, uh, you kind of said that, that we are kind of uh, opening the, up the hood. So, um, when we talked about how BAF uh, uses a single configuration file and kind of deploys the various components on a, on a Kubernetes cluster, so uh, the exact flow kind of happens same and it's consistent across all the DLTs. So, uh, I mean, uh, for, for what you see on the slide is particularly for uh, Hyperledger Fabric. And uh, so the automation here starts from a developer on an operator uh, putting a config, single configuration file. So this configuration file is consumed or, uh, as or taken as an input by the, um, our master playbook, which is, uh, which, is, which is a playbook in Ansible. Uh, so, and the Ansible kind of contains all the roles and tasks. So as you see here in the box, the various roles and tasks are like, uh, I mean, kind of uh, create channel or create channel artifacts uh, and, and, and various other uh, functions 
or task and roles, you can call them. So these task and roles kind of takes that single configuration file and breaks into multiple configuration file. So the work of Ansible here is, as Mike has already kind of mentioned in uh, the previous slides, that it breaks it into multiple configurations, which are then uh, becomes an input as a Helm value files to the Helm. So, uh, and this kind of happens and is managed via the uh, GitOps, so, or, 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 or the Flux, basically. So um, all, all the value files management and the operation around that is not done directly by Ansible. It gets kind of, uh, this the Flux keeps in uh, sync of whatever new configurations has been approved and via the uh, Helm, it applies it to Kubernetes. So uh, on the Helm side, you'll see that uh, all the various um, kind of um, uh, deployments or the components which a DLT network, uh, in this case, Fabric would require are, are, are provided. So for example, uh, uh, various uh, membership uh, service providers, the peer nodes, uh, as well as the orderer uh, configuration with various uh, consensus mechanism, Kafka raft, uh, as well as various channel management like creation of a channel, joining of a channel, all those uh, features are part of the Helm um, uh, Helm charts or Helm configure. I mean Helm files, which 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 are kind of deploy deploys those components on Kubernetes. Uh, and um, also uh, the major part of the automation uh, you, you see is on the top, which is the Docker or uh, image repository basically. So in, in case of Fabric, uh, we use uh, the Fabric official images. So all the official images provided by Fabric are used uh, as it is. And um, this can be uh, used from a, directly from a public repository or can also be kept in a private repository, built and, built and kept in a private repository and can be used uh, in, the, uh, in the BAF automation. So um, Mike, Great. I mean, um, yeah. yeah. Do you want to add something? Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, what may be helpful is, is we can sort of talk about experiences uh, with with Fabric and, and using this a little bit. And, you know, I, I think back in 2000, wow, was it 18, 2000, maybe or even early 19, we, we started doing, um, we, we started implementing this with some customers. And one of our first customers was a, was a large uh, internet technology company who, uh, wanted us to implement this on, on uh, Google Cloud Platform. And so uh, while our development team has done all of our work on AWS, um, the, the, the first actual implementation was, was on GCP. And uh, what was really interesting about that is, is you know, we took the, the source code as it was. We, weren't, we hadn't even open sourced yet, but right? it's still very, very early stages. Uh, but the team took what we had and, and used it as the basis of, of their implementation with a customer. And what was really great about that is we got to see how it got used, right? And we were able to incorporate uh, feedback of what worked and what didn't, and actually uh, start to incorporate some of the things that they added to the platform back into the core. And I think, you know, that was really interesting. Um, while we don't test on GCP currently as a dev team, we just, you know, mm -hmm. cost of infrastructure, the, the ability to know that it did work and it worked almost seamlessly. There was not too much that needed to be done to get it to work was, was sort of a validation there. And this is back in the early stages. Um, and, and then we've also implemented this at a, a large uh, uh, media company. Uh, and we what was interesting there is that this was a media company looking to build a loyalty platform, right? They wanted to build a, a loyalty platform across multiple of their media states. They, so they wanted to exchange these points across a, a number of their different uh, partners. And um, what they wanted was fabric. So they, they told us it had to be fabric and it had to be on Azure. Um, and if anyone's familiar, familiar with the capabilities of uh, blockchain uh, platforms on Azure today, you'll know that uh, the, they, they do not have a current GA version of fabric in their, their managed service. And so what we said is, yes, we can do this and let it, we can help make this go faster with blockchain automation framework. Um, but what we also heard from, from that uh, media company was we, we want to use the Azure services. We're, we're all in on Azure. We want to use these cloud native services from Azure as much as possible. Uh, so we can really take advantage of our investment there and in, in our strategic relationship with Microsoft. 
And we said, great, we can do that as well. And uh, what we did there is we actually replaced uh, HashCorp Vault with a Azure um, uh, Key Vault. I think I got the right name. Yep. Uh, so we replaced it with Azure Key Vault. And we did, um, and it worked uh, very well. That 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 change was, you know, a week or so of, of developer effort, I think, to actually make that change. And then, you know, a more, few more times to get through the testing. But overall, it's a very simple integration. And the fact that this has been designed, and you can, for those that are familiar with this type of architecture, this is fairly pluggable, right? You can swap in different images, you can swap in different Helm charts fairly easily, and and there isn't a whole lot of dependency here. So overall, that validated our uh, our approach, and also gives us more confidence and, and more sort of ability to say we can do this in, in other places. So. Um, I think overall, the Fabric's been our bigger, biggest platform uh, that we've used with blockchain automation framework. Uh, but I, we've had really good feedback from those organizations that have, have used blockchain automation framework in, in their implementation. Right. So I think, Mike, uh, most of the features which we see here are kind of uh, based on and kind of from those feedbacks from our customers and also uh, kind of still we are shaping uh, based on their uh, requirements and as well as community demands. Yep. Fine. So next we're going to talk about Corda Enterprise. Now just a reminder, uh, we started with Corda open source, right? Uh, going with our original principles, uh, we wanted everything to be open source. We didn't want there to necessarily be a lock-in with a given, um, with a with you know IP and getting tied into licenses and commercials, but we also heard from our customers for those that were really serious about production. When they were serious about production with Corda, they were not using open source, right? They were going and talking to R three and getting you know a commercial license with them, and so um, we knew we needed to do enterprise as well and provide that option. And there are official images, some official, some non official images from from R three. That we wanted to integrate and, and the the way in which it impl is implemented is is different and so um Subhajit, do you want to talk us through how how is corda different in the way we approach it given that we have sort of this enterprise open source mix yeah uh, sure mike so yeah um like uh, i mean in, in a consistent way it kind of happens the same way but if we look at some of the differences it's basically uh the arch based on our uh, corda architecture we have to kind of change in the roles and the settings. So, um, uh, so if I have to talk about some of the images, uh, some of them were officially available by Corda. Some of them we had to kind of build and create. So for example, uh, the architecture around the Corda Enterprise Firewall, also uh, how the hierarchy of the services will be uh, deployed in the network. So based on those uh, architectural or the process uh, I mean, process definition or, or or how we kind of thought that will create based on that we we have to had to change and design uh, our roles uh, and and our charts. So uh, mostly the, the the differences here I would say is uh, on the on the features that that are currently uh, put into the particular uh, DLT uh, architecture. So uh, the way how uh, how we have to connect to, uh, our nodes and how the uh, sequence of the various um, services. For example, uh, in Core Enterprise, we have the CNM, which, uh, is, which is a core to the network. So those things we have to take care and have to kind of create in a, in a different way. And, yeah, and I think uh, I'm, I'm gonna interject and just tell like, if we take a quick step back here, what we just covered was, you know, a Hyperledger open source framework of Fabric, and then a, you know, a, a software, uh, enterprise software license, and they're using the same fundamental structure. And if you think about what that means, then is you could have a single Git repository essentially deploying multiple uh, DLT networks independently, and they would be separate. Um, but you know, future. So think a few years out from now. We also, if you think about what we're doing in Hyperledger Cactus as well, for those who aren't familiar, it's focused on interoperability. 
You can also then layer on hyperledric cactus in a future world, in a future state, that would actually allow you to interoperate across all these different DLT networks as well. So you can have one platform to actually deploy and manage the DLT networks, and then another framework, another hyperledger framework to actually integrate those different DLT networks. And, and, and so what if, if you're not catching on to the theme, the idea here is we want to bring down those barriers of organizations being worried about choosing the wrong DLT platform or choosing the wrong network and know that there's consistent ways that we can bring these things together. I'm an architect, I fully understand there's trade-offs when we do that and there are a whole bunch of other things that come into play. Uh, but if you start to think about how we bring the Hyperledger greenhouse together and how do we bring just this, this consistency of how can we all work together across different ecosystems, this is really a, a big focus of ours um, and just trying to make it easier for everyone to do that and allow the entire marketplace to accelerate and move faster. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll let you uh, speak a little bit more, Suvajita, about is there anything you want to highlight as it relates to Hyperledger Indie? Obviously, a very different platform focused on identity and, and right. really what's intended to do. Were there any sort of challenges you had or, or differences as we as we implemented Indie versus some of these more general purpose DLT platforms? Right. Uh, so uh, for Indie, in fact, we kind of, um, if I have to look back and see, there were a couple of challenges, particularly regarding the uh, Indie key management. So uh, we, we, uh, there was no uh, out-of-box solution provided. So we had to kind of manage uh, that ourselves. We created an image and we are using it for uh, all the key management. Uh, also, uh, uh, there were some kind of, uh, if I have to go uh, and kind of talk about um, how uh, the communication between various nodes operate. So uh, Indie, as we all, I mean, we, if you know that uh, it kind of does not uh, support uh, DNS, we have to provide uh, I static IPs to that. So those kind of things we have to take care of. We had to think uh, out of box solutions and kind of, in fact, had to configure our um, ambassador to support those things. And uh, yeah, overall, in terms of uh, general flow wise and consistent way of deployment, it remains the same, but yeah, um, we have to configure or create some features or charts very specific to the requirement uh, and, and the limitations of particular DLT network. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I think for people who aren't familiar with Indy, um, just understanding that Indy is just a small part of the de uh, decentralized identity story Right, there's, there's areas and a lot more of the functionality is actually built into the wallet where the, the people have control over their own identity. So, um, you know, Indy is just a small part of that overall solution and, and hopefully people uh, who are familiar and, and, you know, part of the Indy project would, would back that, those statements up. Uh, so we're gonna talk about one more and, you know, I think it's one of the, the newer platforms in Hyperledger, right. but I, we were very excited to, to get to Besu as well. Do um, you want to talk a little bit about, uh, I think we, we got involved in trying to get Besu in very early um, after it joined Hyperledger. So do you want to talk a little bit about um, what we were able to do there and, and how, yeah. how well that went and getting it onboarded to BAF? Right. I mean, uh, I mean uh, we, we, as you said, Mike, we kind of started with uh, Besu uh, quite early. And uh, though it was our latest addition to BAF, um, what you see here is that uh, it's, it's kind of very base, basic right now, and uh, we are still kind of developing those features. We are trying to understand what are the different requirements or the, uh, which the community needs and trying to kind of uh, make it more consistent with other uh, platforms which we have. So um, we are still kind of working on uh, creating the base network setup with things like uh, enabling boot nodes and as well as uh, uh, so right now, uh, BSU is also kind of uh, uh, upgrading their uh, their images and charts. So we are also kind of trying to see uh, if we, we we need those things. So uh, we are currently kind of uh, I would say work in progress in BSU. Great, thank you. Okay, well let's take a, a little snapshot. Um, again, any questions, please please throw them out. Um, but if I have to talk about We've had a great success um, from an Accenture perspective um, on, on BAF. I, we're using it, like I said, with, with a number of our customers. And uh, we've had great, great success. And um, I think 
the Hyperledger Labs program overall is often an overlooked capability within Hyperledger. Um, you know, we don't have to be a top level project in order to, to have something open sourced under Hyperledger. And, uh, you know, our original intent in, in open sourcing in labs was to see if there's other people, other organizations that were interested um, in, in this type of solution and, and wanted to contribute. Um, so you can see we, we've personally had, you know, five plus customer implementations uh, where this is being used in production. Um, we have, uh, you know, great successes in terms of reducing the amount of time to set up some of this stuff and conform to a strong reference architecture. Um, and in the open source community, we've had a lot of people, um, I'd say a lot of more experimentation than contribution at this point. Um, and for me, what would be the ultimate success here is if other people, other organizations think this is valuable as well and, and wanted to contribute. Um, the goal here is not to, is to accelerate the entire ecosystem, not just accelerate things for Accenture. Um, and so the best way we can do that is to have other, other organizations um, to contribute and, and participate. And we have had a very active uh, participants in terms of use, I'd say, uh, but you know, we'd love to see more contributors contributing those. There's so many features that we'd love to do um, that, that we can't get to all of them. So we'd love to see, see more contr contributors there. Um, and the Hyperledger staff has been really great, even as a lab project with the marketing, the events, and getting our, the word out that this even exists as a platform. And I think this webinar is a great, great example of that, of that as well. Okay, so Vijit, you want to talk about, we'll talk about Fabric, again, the most popular platform that we've seen, especially amongst the Hyperledger community, um, in terms of use of BAF. You want to talk a little bit about what we have in in the platform yeah. today and where we're going for Fabric? Right, uh, so uh, what we have already implemented um, is that we have an Hyperledger Fabric network with version support for both uh, 1.4.4 and 2.2. So 2.2 has been our latest uh, introduction to Fabric. So this is also based on uh, one of our uh, customer uh, requirements and also what we found that uh, it kind of Hyperledger Fabric has upgraded to that and it had a lot of other uh, features and uh, different uh, things to which we, we wanted to kind of incorporate and uh, looked ahead and we, we found value, value in that. So we have added that new version. Uh, we have consensus support for both Kafka and Raft, Raft being uh, kind of uh, for both the versions, Kafka we had support for 1.4.4. Uh, and in terms of network operational features, uh, we kind of have the peers, orders, and channels addition, as well as a removal of an organization. We have Hyper, uh, the uh, Hyperledger Fabric integrated with our reference application, which is our supply chain uh, application, which is a five organization consortium. Uh, and uh, it kind of supports both uh, Go and uh, Java chain codes. Uh, and uh, if we look at our uh, the roadmap and what Mike had all uh, previously also mentioned, that what we are currently focusing on is more of how to make the network more operable. Uh, how can we uh, kind of uh, have more operational features? And based on that, our priority uh, is on that. So if you see, uh, most of them are kind of uh, uh, regarding the operational features like uh, enabling addition of uh, new peers uh, to an organization as, as an anchor peer, and also uh, addition of um, organizations to consortium, as well as uh, regarding channel management, removal, add adding of new channels, etc. cetera. Uh, also uh, right now in Fabric, we have um, uh, multiple order, but all of them are part of a single organization. So we are also looking forward to enable support to have uh, multiple organizations enabled in the network. So yeah, most of the things uh, which we have planned forward is towards um, towards uh, operational features enhancements. So uh, Mike, I think, uh, can we move to the next one? Yeah, so uh, we are also following it consistent across all the DLTs. So here also, if you see with the other DLTs as well, our focus lies on particularly upgrading those uh, DLT platforms to the latest support uh, kind of, uh, uh, and also some of the operational features which we have. So for BSU, as I said, it's it's quite quite new, and we are still kind of trying to uh, get it um, into a more uh, proper uh, network. So 
things like enabling boot nodes, node discoveries, uh, which are kind of uh, enabled uh, in the latest versions of Besu. So those those up versions upgrade will, will enable us to kind of uh, create and enable those features on the network. Also, we, we are planning to integrate uh, our, the, our same sample supply chain reference application with Besu as well. Um, similar to Corda, uh, uh, we have the operational features like uh, supporting uh, multiple notary organizations, supporting uh, multiple nodes of a single or from by a single organization, and also removal or the certification revocation of a particular organization from the network. Uh, uh, Indy, uh, we, we are quite stable, uh, I guess, with uh, Indy deployment. We have um, right now what, what we have planned is kind of look at different um, op operational features or additional features which we can provide. So on that, what we have planned is that to have various language support for the rep app. And also if, we, uh, if, if there are kind of different additional database supports um, and version upgrades. So, yep, that's on the features currently we have. That's great. Thanks, Uvajit. I think it's taking us to the, the, the end where we're opening up for questions. We've had a quiet group so far. Are there any questions out there on, on what we presented? It doesn't have to be on blockchain automation framework, but preferably. Um, So uh, I well, we have three more minutes, so we don't really have that much time for questions. But um, do you are you planning to submit uh, at some point BAF as a project just like Cactus, or do you think you'll be staying in the labs for a while? You know, I, I think uh, the technical steering committee looks at the longevity of projects and, and their ability to be maintained. And I think one key aspect that we don't have right now is other organizations that are contributing. Um, I, I think that would be uh, uh, what we'd need to, in order to go to top level project. Um, we, I think that's the key for us. I think everything else is pretty much in place, but uh, to know that this isn't just a tied to Accenture, I think is key before it becomes a, a top level project. Yeah, well, that makes sense. And I, I do hope that this webinar and all the efforts that you're doing right now to get the broader community participation will pay off because it's really worth it. It's a great project. Um, well, thank you for this. If there are no more questions, uh, I'm going to just close it out with a couple of uh, announcements or information. But if you have questions, please pop them in the Q&A or raise your hand. Uh, this is the time to, to ask those questions. In the meantime, um, next webinar will be in a month's time on January 20th, uh, and it will be a different format. So we are starting a very new format, an hour or so with um, this time Smart Block Laboratory. And we want to have a more interactive guided discussions. You could expect demos, tutorials, brainstorming, it will be hopefully no more just a one-way communication. We want people to participate. So if you want to take part in our experiment, uh, please uh, sign up for, for the webinar and join us on January the 20th. And please do get involved as um, today's uh, panelists uh, or presenters described or said, we are looking for more contributions. We want you to contribute. And that doesn't mean only coding. It can be testing, it can be participating. Um, you know, whatever it is, I'm sure you have an expertise that will help Hyperledger and you will have fun. So go to our website, go to our wiki, join the mailing lists and let's see where it takes you. For now, Thank you for joining us. And if you have any more questions or you want to get in touch with our today's presenters, um, please um, email membership at hyperledger.org. And guys, thank you so much for presenting. It was really interesting and I really appreciate your time. Great, thanks for having us. This was really fun. Thanks. Thank you.